I want to begin with a shout out to Richard Medhurst for his recent video, America Just Replaced One Monster with Another. Definitely give that a watch. And definitely share on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and anywhere else you share things. Next, I want to deal with a couple of comments that came underneath yesterday's show. Viewers stung by leftist intractability, Greenwald critique, and Johnstone Bolivia propaganda. I'm always hopeful that you'll join the fray by going back to these shows and commenting under them. Susanna from a few days ago is still trying to get in the last word. Howl Underground, you are so sure of yourself for being right that much. I laugh at your confidence in your moral superiority when you people, when you people who did not vote, did not vote, I voted, I voted for Howie Hawkins. When you people who did not vote did absolutely nothing to save our country. Oh, well, you saved it, obviously. Just watch Richard Medhurst and you'll see how much you saved our country. And we aren't duping people. We are trying to reform the party. What? You aren't duping people, but you are trying to reform the party? Those two things don't go together. It's like Sesame Street. Which one of these things doesn't belong? Reforming the party? Duping the people? Reforming the party? Duping the people? Pretending to reform the party? We're trying to reform the party by getting new fresh blood in there. That's called sheepdogging. And we can't get them in there if we can't even get them elected. Yeah, but why do you want them in there when they're just going to suck up to power? And in order to be elected, you need to earn some goodwill with people. Familiarize your ideas and make them believe in you. Yes, yeah, suck up to the comfy Dems and make them believe in you. No thank you. Constantly criticizing your own coalition, it's not my fucking coalition, doesn't create faith among your weakest supporters or give you the result you all are looking for. You know, I'm not even sure I'm looking for a result at this point other than to maintain my moral credibility. You certainly aren't succeeding in that. And I don't know if you heard, says Susanna, all of the progressive candidates have won their election and more have been added. And yeah, I bet corporatists are crying about it. But so what? They didn't evolve their platforms. I'm not sad or mad about that at all. So look, Susanna, we have all of these new people in there who are just going to get hooked into the power structure and suck up to Mama Bear and Chucky the Shoom. This is no victory if they, like Ilhan and Rashida, end up sucking up to power and trying to get people like Biden elected. Getting good people into the Democratic Party is not a laudable goal. That's called sheepdogging. Leftists don't let other leftists vote corporatist? Ha! Say that when we have that kind of luxury to worry about something like that. Like when we are a majority. We, like we Democrats, right? Are a majority and have taken up room in all three branches. Well, based on what I've seen over the last 40 plus years, having Democrats in all three branches doesn't get us shit. It might keep the comfy Dems comfy, but it doesn't do anything for poor people. As I said, feel free to reply yourself under here. I said, we aren't Dems any longer. We are done being herded. If you are a leftist, you are not pinning any hopes on Dems. They will only get sucked into Pelosi's and Schumer's corporate web. I will trust our new progressives after they leave the party. I also linked Susanna to a show where she's prominently featured, and feel free to go back and make comments there too if you like. Under yesterday's show, we have the revenge of the Bernie to Biden wine track moms. Here's Auntie Anne to illustrate. It's funny how you believe we need anyone's permission or guidance to vote any which way. It's even funnier how you believe only you hold the keys to the correct way to be a leftist. I don't need an authoritarian to tell me, really? An authoritarian to tell me I can or can't vote for anyone. I didn't vote for Trump or Biden, but nobody, not Nick Brana, you or anyone else, is allowed to shame me even if I did. You have lost your way in your attempt to radicalize yourself, and it's unfortunate. You didn't used to lean authoritarian. So then Christian comes back. How is he authoritarian? Christian, demanding submission to one's own very rigid ideology is the definition of authoritarian. <laughs> Ooh. No, no, sorry. B 
believe what he believes, how he chooses to define it, or you don't get to be in the club. Last I looked, this guy wasn't the arbiter of what qualifies as the left, and I'll vote or not vote how I damn well please. Thank you very much. Then Christian says, Auntie Anne, it's not authoritarian. It's not like he has a gun to people's heads and forces them to vote Green Party. He is telling us that voting for corporate Biden is not leftist. And he is right. How can someone be a leftist and vote for Biden? That's just as bad as voting for Trump. And if you're Richard Medhurst or Victor Tiffany, you think it's worse than voting for Trump. And you're not wrong. And then I tell Anne, this logic would be laughable if it were not so prevalent. It's the same as when sociopaths label their victims as controlling when they resist gaslighting. And this is gaslighting, pure and simple. Anne doesn't like it when we call her out on her bullshit, on her immoral voting behavior, except she's not immorally voting apparently, but she doesn't want us to call anyone out for their immoral voting behavior. And that's just not gonna happen. The sociopaths and their dupes can't gaslight us into saying that it's okay to vote for corporatists. Now I'll read you some excerpts from Donald Trump was never the real problem. This is by Ken Orphan on Dandelion Salad. But let's be frank, Donald Trump was never the real problem. He was and is the rancid product of a centuries-long experiment in racist colonial settler imperialism first born on the continent, then later exported to the entire world. It started when European settlers set foot on this occupied new world and declared it their own. Native peoples be damned. The U.S. just experienced its biggest voter turnout in 150 years, yet it did not produce the so-called blue wave so many liberals were hoping for. Trump, the festering pile of orange dung that has haunted the Oval Office for the last four years, should have been crushed in any election in a free and equal society, yet nearly half of those who voted chose that proto-fascist dung heap, the one who ripped children from the arms of their parents and put them in cages as they sobbed uncontrollably, kind of like Barack Obama did, the same one who has openly encouraged violence from his more extremist fan base. The one who said neo-Nazis were very fine people. The one who commanded racist terrorists to stand back and stand by. The one who has mocked healthcare professionals and science while a fully preventable pandemic surges across the country. The grab em by the pussy chauvinist who has been accused of sexual assault by at least 26 women. The one so many evangelicals sickeningly fawn over as if he were the American version of the biblical King David. The one who has consistently demonized the press as well as anti-racist and anti-fascist activists. Well, to be fair, I've been demonizing the press too, but for different reasons. Why? Why did they support Donald Trump? How can this be possible? Because white America, liberal and conservative alike, has for too long been drunk on its own hubris, willfully blind to the misery it has inflicted through apathy or deliberate policy. It has been continually hand-fed the lie of its supposed greatness from CIA slash Hollywood propagandists for decades. It has continually been hand-fed the lie of the free market, ridiculing socialists and anarchists while millions languish in shanty towns outside of cities like Los Angeles or in capitalism's industrial cancer alleys. And its dissidents, of whom there have been many, have been repeatedly chided, silenced, or ruthlessly punished for daring to expose the lies for what they are. One sits in a gulag in Britain awaiting his fate at this very moment. America is, in fact, an empire in a state of deep decline on a planet ever besieged by warmongering, ecocidal psychopaths far more interested in accumulating coin than protecting even the lives of their own children and grandchildren. Joe Biden, a lingering ghoul of America's past racist and genocidal forays, was peddled to the country as the only viable alternative to a proto-fascist. A man whose groping hands have unwelcomingly caressed more buttocks than can be counted, who proudly cavorted with segregationists, authored a crime bill that sent impoverished black and brown kids packing to prison, championed a war based on lies that took hundreds of thousands of lives, if not more, more, many more, 
who continues to defend apartheid in the Middle East and military juntas in Central America, who still lauds fracking amidst a climate meltdown, and who refuses to consider anything close to universal health care in the midst of a pandemic. This was the alternative, and yet so many liberals still incredulously wonder why he didn't garner much enthusiasm. Regardless of the outcome, it should be clear that the U.S. is a failed state. While most of its people are decent and willing to engage with a world far bigger than its borders, a sizable chunk of its constituency has demonstrated it is not. A sizable chunk has embraced fascism even if they are unable to define such a term. This is a fact that must be stated plainly and its belligerent government's disregard for facts or even a modicum of decency, cooperation, compassion, or conscience has been revealed to every inhabitant on the planet and in very stark terms. It cannot and should not ever be trusted. In fact, its dissolution is the only hope we have for a livable future on Earth. But instead of dissolution, we get Michelle Flournoy. And this is why and how we got Michel Flournoy. It was an inside job. Tony Blinken, second from left, has been Vice President Joe Biden's right-hand man for almost two decades. They had been public servants their whole careers, but when Hillary Clinton lost the 2016 election, two departing Obama officials were anxious for work. Trump's win had caught them by surprise. Sergio Aguirre and Nitin Chada had reached the most elite quarters of U.S. foreign policy. Aguirre had started out of school as a fellow in the White House and a decade later had become chief of staff to UN Ambassador Samantha Power. Chadda, who joined the Pentagon out of college as a speechwriter, had become a key advisor to Secretary of Defense Ash Carter in even less time. Now Chadda had a long shot idea. They turned to an industry of power brokering little known outside the capital, strategic consultancies. Retiring leaders often open firms bearing their names. Madeleine Albright has one, as do Condoleezza Rice and former Secretary of Defense William S. Cohen. Their strategic consultancies tend to blur corporate and governmental roles. This obscure corner of Washington is critical to understanding how a President Joe Biden would conduct foreign policy. He has been picking top advisors from this shadowy world. At the outset of a new administration, high-ranking officials often join one of a dozen such firms which are surprisingly bipartisan in their makeup to help companies navigate the areas where their relationships give them power. The model was pioneered by Henry Kissinger, who through Kissinger Associates represented American Express and Coca-Cola, among other banks and transnationals. In Beijing, Washington, and developing countries, strategic consultants help corporations manage tricky regulations, potential crises, and new markets. Their behind-the-scenes work in world capitals can look a lot like lobbying. The problem for Aguirre and Chada was that neither young man was a marquee name. Chada realized that the latest crop of senior officials hadn't yet started their own consultancies. The thought for us was to build a living and breathing platform with those who are enthusiastic about serving again, he said. Staying up late one night, they drafted a plan and came up with the first target they would pitch. Michel Flournoy had served as Undersecretary of Defense for Policy from 2009 to 2012. Both Aguirre and Chada had known her well in the Obama administration. Since leaving office, she'd spent several years in consulting and was hitting her stride. With Flournoy as senior advisor, Boston Consulting Group's defense contracts grew from $1.6 million in 2013 to $32 million in 2016. Before she joined, according to public records, BCG had not signed any contracts with the Defense Department. So back in July, they called this, if a Democrat were to win office, Michelle Flournoy would likely become the first woman defense secretary. Ding, ding, ding. Flournoy, while consulting, joining corporate boards and serving as a senior fellow at Harvard's Belfer Center, had also become CEO of the Center for a New American Security in 2014. The think tank had an annual budget of about $9 million and defense contractors donated at least $3.8 million while she was CEO. By 2017, she was making $452,000 a year. Intrigued by Aguirre and Chada's idea of starting her own shop, she had one condition. Find another big name so it wouldn't just be Flournoy and Associates. They needed another co-founder. 
Establishing a new firm was an investment and a risk, and many Obama officials were already spoken for, some headhunted by corporations or consultancies, others returning to academic appointments or finding respite in research institutions, many wearing all those hats at once. Flournoy could carry her own private practice, but she didn't want a firm with her name on it alone. The trio reached out to defense and intelligence honchos, but with no luck. Then a particular Washington fixture came to light. He had been Vice President Joe Biden's right-hand man for almost two decades and finished out the Obama administration as Deputy Secretary of State. He was known for his unimpeachable ethics. Having written Biden's speeches for years, he had started to enunciate with the Vice President's drawl when he appeared on CNN. He had never cashed in on his international connections, years of face time with Saudi, Israeli, and Chinese leaders. His name was Tony Blinken. With his commitment to join Flournoy as founding partner, a new strategic consultancy was born. They called it West Exec Advisors. West Executive Avenue runs along the west wing of the White House, the connection between presidential power and the offices where aides sit and do the real work. The name West Exec Advisors trades on its founders' recent knowledge of the highest echelons of decision-making. It also suggests they'll be walking down West Exec toward 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue someday soon. Very soon. The Obama campaign in 2008 made a pledge to exclude lobbyists from policy deliberations and once in office, policy-making. Lobbyists are not bad people, the then Senator Joe Biden said. Special interest groups are not bad people, but they are corrosive. Biden was the most modest vice president in recent history, coming into office with a net worth of less than $150,000. But afterward, he made big money, profiting from a multi-million dollar book deal and earning $540,000 annually from a University of Pennsylvania center named for him that doesn't involve any teaching. He nevertheless promoted himself as middle-class Joe. I work for you, not any industry, he tweeted last year. But many of the people who work closely with Biden are enmeshed in the opaque world of strategic consultancies and by extension, a network of the world's biggest businesses. If they've been consulting for corporations with offshore interests, this spells potential conflicts. One of the biggest gaps in ethics laws is that we don't require strategic consultants to register as lobbyists, said Mandy Smithberger of the Project on Government Oversight. Skipping ahead in this article, last year, West Exec's corporate interests and their policymaking at last collided. On January 7, 2019, Tony Blinken and Michelle Flournoy chaired the biannual meeting of the liberal organization Foreign Policy for America. Over 50 representatives of national security groups gathered in a boardroom at the Madison Hotel in Washington. Blinken and Flournoy's roles with West Exec were not listed on the invitation or on the FP4A website. The group worked through 24 agenda items and the last one was the war in Yemen. Many Obama diplomats had expressed remorse for enabling Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman's destructive campaign in the Arab world's poorest country. In 2015, Obama had dispatched Blinken to tell Mohammed bin Salman that the U.S. supported Saudi Arabia's right to defend itself and nothing more. But four years later, the U.S., through its arms sales, was party to an ongoing war. The death toll was over 100,000 in an asymmetric conflict, and the defense contractor Raytheon had sold Saudi Arabia more than $3 billion worth of bombs. Four hours into the marathon policy discussion, many former officials joined progressive advocates in urging an end to weapon sales. The starting point, per FP4A's agenda, was to ask Congress to halt U.S. military involvement in the conflict. Most participants supported cutting all weapon sales, but one person stood apart. Flournoy tried to persuade the group that an outright ban on arms sales to Saudi Arabia wouldn't be a good idea. Putting conditions on their use was a better compromise, she said, one that defense contractors wouldn't lobby against, according to two attendees. Flournoy told me she had made a distinction between offensive and defensive weapons, saying that Saudi Arabia needed advanced Patriot missiles to protect itself. 
It was an argument she had been making around the Capitol, but it didn't resonate among the left-leaning room and didn't affect the group's recommendation. To two people present, it sounded like Flournoy was working for Raytheon, which produces Patriot missiles. Flournoy would not confirm whether West Exec currently works for them. Raytheon was not being considered as a client at that point, she said. When I take a policy position, I do so because I think it is in U.S. interests and the views I express are solely my own, no one else's. Certainly not Raytheon's. Another West Exec staffer wouldn't comment on whether the consultancy has Raytheon as a client, but would only say the defense contractor is in the ballpark, noting they work for a defense prime, meaning one of the top five defense firms among which Raytheon ranks. West Exec's own Robert Work has served on Raytheon's board since 2017. So all this is to say, and this lengthy and well-researched article says all of it, is that Flournoy is on the inside. Flournoy is part of the deep state, and Flournoy, make no mistake, is going to end up as our Secretary of Defense. Yahoo News says, Michelle Flournoy could become the first woman to run the Pentagon. Here's what would change. Wait, I thought we were going to have no fundamental change. The deep state doesn't like change, does it? At least not where Raytheon is concerned. On June 20th, 2016, then-Vice President Joe Biden delivered keynote remarks at an event hosted by the Center for a New American Security, the think tank founded and at that point led by Michelle Flournoy. Flournoy introduced Biden, praising him as a national security thinker and noting the ties between his staff at the White House and CNAS. Biden, in turn, acknowledged the little-kept secret of the defense world, that Flournoy was in line to become the first woman to serve as defense secretary under President Hillary Clinton. Well, Madam Secretary, Biden said with a laugh as the crowd applauded, I'm writing a recommendation for her, you know. The Clinton administration never materialized following the election of President Donald Trump, but four years later, President-elect Biden is widely expected to fulfill his promise and tap Flournoy to lead the U.S. military. So all of you people saying that Donald Trump is worse than Biden in every way, consider this. These assholes, these consultants, always land on their feet. Skipping ahead in this article, following the outcome of the 2016 election, Flournoy stepped down from running the think tank and launched West Exec Advisors, a government consultancy group alongside Anthony Blinken, a former national security advisor to then Vice President Biden. Blinken has been a senior advisor to Biden during the presidential campaign and, like Flournoy, is expected to land a top job should Biden win the race, perhaps as Secretary of State or National Security Advisor. Wow, that's great. The West exec team is rounded out by more than a dozen individuals who held positions at the State Department, the Department of Defense, or the National Security Council during the Obama administration. Among them is Eli Ratner, who perhaps best personifies the Flournoy-Biden connection. Ratner was a CNAS fellow who joined the Obama administration, became Biden's deputy national security advisor, then returned to CNAS as director of studies. He is also expected to take a role in a new Biden administration. Skipping ahead, asked how Flournoy would deal with people not falling in line, the former employee said, people would be too embarrassed to let that happen. No one wants to be the person to let Michelle down. This respect from throughout the defense community would likely lead to a fairly smooth confirmation hearing. The toughest questions could come from progressives over her business dealings while at West Exec. A July feature on the firm in the American Prospect, that's the article I just quoted before this one, cast the group as cashing in on ties formed during government service. Ding, ding, ding. But that's as much as Yahoo News has the stomach for, so then they go right on and say, but what would a Flournoy-led Defense Department look like? And then it all looks rosy from there on in. But we know what it would look like. It would look like business as usual. Raytheon would continue to make beaucoup bucks. Beaucoup d'argent. Oui. This counterpunch article is what started me down this rabbit hole about Michelle Flournoy. Will Michelle Flournoy be the angel of death for the American empire? This was prescient. 
If the Democrats manage to push Joe Biden over the finish line in November's election, he will find himself presiding over a decadent, declining empire. He will either continue the policies that have led the American empire to decadence and decline, or seize the moment to move our nation into a new phase, a transition to a peaceful and sustainable post-imperial future. And he's going to do that how? By tapping Michelle Flournoy as Secretary of Defense. That's how. The foreign policy team Biden assembles will be key, including his choice for Secretary of Defense. But Biden's rumored favorite, Michelle Flournoy, is not the gal for this historic moment. Yes, she would break the glass ceiling as the first female Secretary of Defense, but as one of the architects of our endless wars and record military budgets, she would only help to steer the American empire farther down its current path of lost wars, corrupt militarism, and terminal decline. Skipping ahead, Trump and his Make America Great Again represent the epitome of imperial hubris, while Biden pushes the time-worn idea that America should be back at the head of the table internationally. That was a direct quote, back at the head of the table. As if America's neo-colonial empire was still in its prime. With enough pressure from the public, Biden might be persuaded, no, to start cutting the imperial military budget to invest in our real needs, from Medicare for All to a Green New Deal, ha ha ha, but that's unlikely if he picks Michelle Flournoy, a diehard militarist who has played instrumental roles in America's failed wars and catastrophic imperial adventures since the 1990s. Let's look at her record. As Assistant Secretary of Defense for Strategy under President Clinton, Flournoy was the principal author of the May 1997 Quadrennial Defense Review, which laid the ideological foundation for the endless wars that followed. Under defense strategy, the QDR effectively announced that the United States would no longer be bound by the UN Charter's prohibition against the threat or use of military force. It declared that, when the interests at stake are vital, money, 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 we should do whatever it takes to defend them, including, when necessary, the unilateral use of military power. This woman is a fucking monster. The QDR defined U.S. vital interests to include preventing the emergence of a hostile regional coalition anywhere on Earth and ensuring uninhibited access to key markets, energy supplies, and strategic resources. By framing the unilateral and illegal use of military force all over the world as defending vital interests, the QDR presented what international law defines as aggression, the supreme international crime, according to the judges at Nuremberg, as a form of defense. Flournoy's career has been marked by the unethical spinning of revolving doors between the Pentagon, consulting firms helping businesses procure Pentagon contracts, and military-industrial think tanks like the Center for a New American Security, CNAS, which she co-founded in 2007. In 2009, she joined the Obama administration as Undersecretary of Defense for Policy, where she helped engineer political and humanitarian disasters in Libya and Syria and a new escalation of the endless war in Afghanistan before resigning in 2012. From 2013 to 2016, she joined Boston Consulting, trading on her Pentagon connections to boost the firm's military contracts from $1.6 million in 2013 to $32 million in 2016. By 2017, Flournoy herself was raking in $452,000 a year. Ka-ching! You know most of the rest of the story, so I'm going to skip ahead again. It says that even though she's not widely blamed for specific military disasters, there's another story to be told. But the articles, papers, and reports that Flournoy and CNAS have published for two decades reveal that she suffers from the same chronic malady as the rest of the Washington foreign policy blob. She pays lip service to diplomacy and multilateralism, but when she has to recommend a policy for a specific problem, she consistently supports the uses of military force that she set out to politically legitimize in the 1997 Quadrennial Defense Review, QDR. When the chips are down, she is one more military-industrial hammerbanger to whom every problem looks like a nail waiting to be whacked by a trillion-dollar high-tech hammer. 
In June 2002, as Bush and his gang threatened aggression against Iraq, Flournoy told the Washington Post that the United States would need to strike preemptively before a crisis erupts to destroy an adversary's weapons stockpile before it could erect defenses to protect those weapons or simply disperse them. She was a good little Bush girl. When Bush unveiled his official doctrine of preemption a few months later, Senator Edward Kennedy wisely condemned it as unilateralism run amok and a call for 21st century American imperialism that no other country can or should accept. And this is where the Democrats gave up any pretense that they are not in reality a very ugly, preemptive war machine. Imperialism run amok. In 2003, as the ugly reality of preemptive war plunged Iraq into intractable violence and chaos, Flournoy and a team of Democratic hawks co-authored a paper titled Progressive Internationalism to define a smarter and better brand of militarism for the Democratic Party for the 2004 election. This is why we don't trust the word progressive, people. While portrayed as a path between the neo-imperial right and the non-interventionist left, it asserted that Democrats will maintain the world's most capable and technologically advanced military and we will not flinch from using it to defend our interests anywhere in the world. Ka-ching! The article goes on to say that Flournoy is very hawkish where China is concerned, which is something Caitlin Johnstone has been warning us about. So it is no surprise that Flournoy's solution to what she presents as a growing threat from China is to invest in a new generation of weapons, including hypersonic and long-range precision missiles and more high-tech unmanned systems. Drones. She even suggests that the U.S. goal in this budget-busting arms race could be to invent, produce, and deploy currently non-existent weapons to sink China's entire navy and civilian merchant fleet, a flagrant war crime in the first 72 hours of a war. Fucking wow. Biden has already said, I've met with a number of my advisors and some have suggested in certain areas the military budget is going to have to be increased. We would remind Biden that he hired these unnamed advisors to advise him not to predetermine the decisions of a candidate who still has to convince the American public he is the leader we need at this difficult time in our history. Picking Michelle Flournoy to lead the Pentagon would be a tragic indication that Biden is truly hell-bent on squandering America's future on a debilitating arms race with China and Russia and a futile, potentially catastrophic bid to resurrect America's declining imperial power. With our economy and our lives devastated by a pandemic, with climate chaos and nuclear war threatening the future of human life on this planet, we are in desperate need of real leaders to navigate and guide America through a difficult transition to a peaceful, prosperous, post-imperial future. Michelle Flournoy is not one of them.